I'll tell you one or two true narrations, and then I'm going to read you my story that none of you have ever read before because it hasn't been published yet in book form, but copies are not on sale yet, which is the best school story I, I've written. Um, some of you know and some of you don't because I'm a writer of fictional ghost stories. Uh, some of you have seen them on television. And in fact, I am now seem to be acclaimed in the, the viewers as the chief American practitioner of the art of ghost stories. There aren't any others, so I'm the chief one. <laughs> there, there are still some good ones in England, particularly Robert Aikman. Anyway, the book, actually, the genre is reviving somewhat. Um, some of you know and some of you don't, but uh, I came from a family which, in my great grandfather this time, was spiritualist and Swedenborgian. Uh, they refused the two. And I lived in a haunted house for much of my life, which was burned down a year ago, Ash Wednesday. Uh, Vanished River, a famous haunted house. I can tell any true tales. And I've had uh, all kinds of ghost experiences, a minor sort of least, in various parts of the world. Uh, Mary Stewart, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Mary Stewart said of, the, of John Knox, the fire follows Master Knox, and ghosts uh, seem to follow me. Uh, I don't have any, any particular theory of ghosts, except the phenomena do occur. Uh, Theories, one can look elsewhere. Uh, you'll find some suggestions from Arthur Kessler's recent book, uh, The Roots of Coincidence, one of the major minds of our time, Arthur Kessler, uh, turning his attention to this field of the supernatural and the uncanny, uh, so called psychical research. Um, at any rate, uh, the American public, which formerly was completely uh, rationalistic and, and incredulous in any such tales, now, in, a, in, a, in the space of less than a decade, it's become totally credulous and will believe any tale of wonder or the fantastic you may tell them. Um, I'm somewhere in between. I will have to exercise a critical judgment here. Uh, one of the uh, leading minds of our time was converted uh, to a belief in what we call ghosts, or in, at any rate, to the objective reality of these, of these strange experiences by uh, painful personal experience. I refer to you, the great psychologist, who began by maintaining that uh, these uh, mysterious phenomena, which we call ghostly, are indeed real, but are, but are subjective, meaning, I suppose, that they occurred in the inner consciousness of the individual, but had no outward reality, so to speak, they were an inner reality. However, Jung went to live in England for some time, and he used to spend his weekends in a certain country house, which is very haunted indeed, and he changed his mind there. Uh, he heard, uh, uh, and here we repeatedly a, a terrible banging on the outside wall of the house where his room was. He'd open the window, look out, and the banging would continue, but there'd be nobody there. And his most startling experience, though, was that uh, while he was sleeping in the house once, uh, he, he woke up at night and found on the pillow beside him the head of an old, old woman. Uh, no body, just a head. And uh, the more alarming thing was that only half the face was there, and the other half wasn't. Um, after that, he was convinced of the objective reality of these, uh, <laughs> of these phenomena. And um, he went to Vienna to talk with uh, Freud about it. Um, and he began explaining his theories to the incredulous Freud. As they were talking, there came a tremendous banging inside a large steel file cabinet. They both stand and stood at it with amazement. And the door burst open, and out came a large iron bar, which no one had ever seen before. It fell on the floor with the claim. The two uh, famous psychologists were so astounded that they stared at each other, and then Jung walked out of the room and walked home. Freud scarcely ever spoke to him after that. Uh, <laughs> thought, apparently, Freud thought he was playing some kind of magical trick on it. <laughs> and the two great men were parted by that the dramatic act of the acting spirit. Um, well, tonight, mostly, I'll, uh, I'll read this story of mine. Uh, it's an example of how ghost of tale can become part of the literary art. My old friend Gerald Hurd uh, used to tell me that any good ghost story must uh, be of a theological character, and I concluded he was quite right. There have been such stories, of course, by the Benson brothers in England. Uh, there's, of course, a large element of supernatural, but a theological cast, actually, and Ray Bradbury, especially in the, his, his uh, romance of Something Wicked This Way Comes. <coughs> and one could give the other examples. Now, uh, at any rate, my, my recent ghost stories, or most recent ones, are 
the theological cast, uh, and uh, they'll be published in a volume by the developer by Arkenhaus in a year or so. Uh, there's one story so far appearing only in, in, in the magazine version about Grumbo's Hell, which is a story of the diabolical, and there's a story called the Savior Gate, named after a street in New York and England, uh, which is uh, paradisical, and uh, there's a story I'm going to read to you tonight, uh, uh, A Long, Long Trail of Winding, uh, which is a purgatorial story. These form a sort of trilogy, although they're not, not the same characters. In the, there's a little overlap of characters, not much. Well, my stories are founded uh, <coughs> not always some kind of grain of true narration, and uh, yeah, there was a very uh, an attempt at least to create uh, stealthily uh, genuine characters, which are important in part forming the life of this person or, or that. Uh, one always has to alter a personal experience somewhat uh, to make it into a fictional form. Personal experiences are usually too brief and fragmentary to have much meaning in themselves, and so you have to embroider to make a good fictional tale of it. But sometimes the actual experience is uh, is more dramatic uh, and more inexplicable uh, than the fiction. This is stranger than fiction. Some of you have read my uh, romance, the Old House of Fear, in which in the second or third chapter, there's a character named Captain Gare, an alarming person who appears and then disappears in the story. Uh, yeah, Captain Gare is based upon an actual experience of mine in, in the most haunted of all towns in the world, uh, St. Andrews in Scotland, which has the noble ghosts. Captain Gare was one of the, if he was a ghost, was uh, someone I, I, uh, I glimpsed only once and uh, never encountered again. On this uh, night in question, I was uh, walking back from uh, playing chess with my friend Tonga McClellan in an old house in Abbey Street, and walking back home about three in the morning, um, which is uh, really more the witching hour than 12 o'clock. It's at three in the morning that most people's uh, energies and consciousness are at lowest ebb. So it's quite the contrary of me. I'm, I'm much more alert at the three in the morning than any other hour. That's my most valuable work is done. I'm always, almost always going to sleep at three in the afternoon, even if I'm standing up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was walking home, and presently, to the great broad medieval street of uh, South Street in St. Andrews, past the great old houses, uh, and uh, about, the, about the past the University Library. The University Library was built by James I and VI, uh, and it uh, has its own ghost. Now, during the, uh, uh, during the 18th century, the University Senate of St. Andrews still had its ancient powers, and a, a janitor of that time, at the beginning of the 18th century, uh, hanged himself from the stair rail in the library, and hanged by the neck until dead. And the University Senate was very annoyed by this, it's an act of sacrilege, and so they condemned the man to hang there in perpetuity. And they took the flesh off his bones and hung his, his uh, bones in a glass case, which remained hanging there for, for more than two centuries um, over the stair rail until a German bomb knocked him down in the Second World War. And they decided to do something enough at that time, and they buried his bones. At any rate, this wolf uh, this janitor is supposed to haunt the pen or entrance to the University Library. And you, you walk by at night, sometimes you find the janitor there. Actually, it's the present uh, living janitor, but he lurking there in the town, apparently hoping to be taken for the second janitor. Giving many people a nasty start <laughs> at three in the morning. Well, I was passing by the library. The janitor wasn't there that night. But I glanced across the street at, at a great building which is now houses the Department of Medieval History of St. Andrews. The house built with the Templars. The Templars were under the Templars in St. Andrews. And standing in front of this building was a curious figure. There was a man standing there short, burly man, shorter than I am, uh, but curiously dressed. He wore a, a derby hat, or a riding uh, jacket, uh, riding breeches, riding boots, and carried a whip in his hand that he was striking against his boots. Uh, and there's no horse anywhere. It was three in the morning, nobody else was seen in the street. I glanced at him, and he stared at me and called out, I say! I replied, uh, yes, sir. He began striding across the street to me, Kind of crying out as he came, Captain Gare, by way of introducing himself, striking his whip against his boots. He came up very close to me, so we should practically know what to know, so we have to head shorter than I am. He's very strongly built. And he's a most peculiar looking man. Um, 
His face was all red and mottled with the red veins, the swollen red and blue veins, the mark of a heavy drinker, the swollen nose. But he wasn't drunk. He walked in a steady enough uh, uh, walk, and his stride uh, and, and his, his speech was, uh, was not confused. It's the words not confused, the utterance. Uh, and, but the most, uh, most surprising thing about him was his eyes. They were tiny little black eyes, and they would flicker back and forth like the eyes of a frightened bird. They were meaning a glance, constantly flickering back and forth. He stared at me. Apparently, I was not the sort of person he expected. He spoke with a bit of bullying tone and cracking his whip against the boot. He looked at me, and uh, I was carrying a heavy, uh, heavily walking stick, and was not the sort of person he apparently expected. So his tone changed, and uh, he stopped cracking the whip against his boot. He said, I say, it's, uh, yes, yes, it's uh, cigarettes, yes, so that's it, uh, cigarettes. No, sir, I said, I don't smoke, I didn't at the time, and I don't know where I could get any, uh, any cigarettes at this hour. No, no, he said, don't misunderstand me, no, 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 it's, I'm not asking for, uh, for cigarettes, no, I, uh, I don't smoke and uh, I don't drink either. And the latter was clearly an untruth because he could smell drinking his breath, uh, even though he was uh, not drunken. He was a man who was always drinking, but apparently almost never what you call drunk. Um, then he hesitated again and said, uh, uh, "No, it's, it's not. It's not cigarettes. No, no. It's uh, yes. That's it. That's it. Uh, it's, it's my. Uh, I, I left my car. Yes, yes, yes. That's it. Uh, petrol. Petrol. Well, I don't know if there's a way to get petrol at this hour. I, I might try the garage in our street. I believe if a car lives above it, you might not there, and uh, you might be able to help you. Oh no, no. He said, "Don't misunderstand me. No, I, I don't. Uh, I don't need petrol. No, I." Uh, no, don't misunderstand me. I'm not in need of any assistance. I said, well, in that case, um, anyway, I can serve you, sir. How long have you lived in this town? He asked. Oh, I said, uh, three or four years off and on. Three or four years. Three or four years. The voice echoing in the, along the empty street. Now the har, the sea fog was gathering around us. He stared at me with his flickering bird-like eyes. Well, if I can be looking for you, sir, then I'll, I'll say good night. Oh, yes, yes. Sir. Good night, then. Good night. I walked away into the fog, glancing over my shoulder. He's still staring there with a hand raised and kind of half salute, looking at me, wonder, like a lost soul, not knowing where he was and how I got there, what the town was, what the, what the year was. Well, I went back home, and the next day I inquired around the shops of St. Andrews and elsewhere, but this person I took to be a local character, you know, not many persons he recognized. No one ever heard, ever heard of a Captain Gale or knew anybody but such description. I inquired at the rest of the time, but nobody has any idea who Captain Gale was. Was he a phantom? If so, can a phantom have whiskey in his breath? Yeah. Phantom of a bottle of whiskey? Yeah, and yet he's, uh, he's acting like a lost soul out of space, out of time, and perhaps he was. So I put that in a modified form into a, my romance of Old House of Fear. Now, uh, the story I'm going to read to you tonight is uh, based upon a real person, Clinton Wallace. Uh, some of you here have met him, the man I call our Burger Butler. Clinton has been on the road since he's uh, 15 or so. He's now over 60. Uh, he's a big, strong man, kind of giant, one of the strongest men I've known. He comes to late. Uh, most of my apartment, we pay any puts in the lottery tickets. I ask him, uh, Clinton, what are you going to do when you win that million dollars in the lottery? Russell, I just like to sit back and take things easy. That was what he's already doing. <laughs> <laughs> he's been with us about five years now. We sent him out on the road the other day as punishment for the fleet and the uh, But he'll be back again before very long. A little chat. He's a very interesting man, really. He memorizes a very quantity of the poetry. He's very fond of children. And the quite, quite amusing, though, really. Uh, he's listed by the, the prison records. I've examined his prison records. He's been in prison half his life. He's listed as dull normal. Either dull or, or normal. Uh, very unusual sort of person. He has no vices except robbing church poor boxes, perhaps from the Catholic ones. The Catholic <laughs> robs his own poor boxes. Uh, doesn't chase women, uh, has no sexual vices, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, uh, never has so much as hell or damn. Uh, model of character in many respects, except that he's consummately lazy and uh, rather selfish. Uh, he's the chief character in the story, and, uh, and so, some of you will know him. I don't think ring, ring true. Actually, there's something else that's been added to the story. Uh, story, a long, long trail of winding. And you'll perceive that the story of the supernatural can be interpreted in, in various ways, and that, that's, that's what life and the, and the other life are like. 
happening. You can't be quite sure what's happening. There are mysteries everywhere. Uh, but there are mysteries are, are genuine, and then there are truths. So I'll read you the story, and if some of you get tired, you can just walk away. It won't bother me. Go away, but I'll, I'll read the end of those who care to listen to it. Uh, it's in a book called Frights, which uh, will be on sale, I suppose, early next month. An anthology edited by Cumberland Macaulay. These are all original and new stories of the supernatural and of the sense. Along, it's a long, long trail of winding. Then he said unto the, unto the, unto the, unto the, the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. That's Luke. <coughs> Along the vast, empty, six-lane highway, the blizzard swept as if it meant to swallow all the sensual world. Frank Sarsfield, a master though he was, scudded like a heavy kite before that overwhelming wind. On his thick white hair, the snow clotted and tried to form a cap. The big flakes so swirled around his baking face that he scarcely could make out the barren country on either side of the road. Somehow, he must get indoors. Racing for sanctuary, the last automobile had swept unheeding past his thumb two hours ago, bound doubtless for the county town some 20 miles eastward. Westward, among the hills, the highway must be blocked by snowdrifts now. This is an unkind 12th of January. Blow, blow the winter winds. Twilight being almost upon him, said he must find lodging or else freeze still by the roadside. He had walked to more than 30 miles that day. Having in his pocket the sum of $29.30, he could have put up at either of the two motels he had passed had they not been closed for the winter. Well, as always, he was decently dressed, a good wash and wear suit and a neat black overcoat. As always, he was shaven and clean and civil spoken. Surely some farmer or villager would take him in to be knocked with a $10, $10 bill on his fist. People sometimes mistook him for a stranded well-to-do motorist and sometimes took the trouble to undeceive them. Uh, but where to apply? This was depopulated country. Its forests gone to the sawmills uh, long before. Its mines worked out. The freeway ran through the abomination of desolation. He did not prefer to walk the freeways, but on such a day as this, there were no cars on the western roads. He had run away from a hard scrabble New England farm when he was 14, and ever since then, except for brief working intervals, he had been either on the roads or in the jails. And now his 60th birthday was imminent. There are few men bigger than Frank Sarsfield and none more solitary. Where was a friendly house? For a few moments, so the rage of the snow slackened. He stared out, he stared about. Away to the left, almost a mile distance, he made out a grim high clump of buildings on rising ground, the wall enclosing it. The roof of the central building was gone. Sarsfield grins, knowing what that complex must be. A derelict prison. He had lodged in prisons altogether too many nights. His hand, the sheltering his eyes from the north wind, he looked to his left. Down in a snug valley beside a narrow river and in broad marshes, he could receive a village or a hamlet, a white church tower, three or four commercial buildings, some little houses, we had them a park of bare maple trees. The old highway must have run through or near this forgotten place, but the new freeway had sealed it off. There was no sign of a freeway exit to the settlement. Probably it could be reached only by some detouring country lane. In such a little decayed town, there would be folk willing to accept him for the sake of his proffered ten dollars, or better, simply for charity's sake and talk of the amusing stranger who could recite every kind of poetry. He scrambled heavily down the embankment. At this point, praise be, no tremendous wire fence kept the haughty new highway inviolate. His powerful thighs took him through the swelling drifts, though his heart pounded as, though, uh, pounded as a storm burst upon him afresh. The village was more distant than he had thought. He passed panting through old fields growing up to poplar and birch. A little to the west, he noticed what seemed to be old mine workings with fragments of brick buildings. He clambered upon an old railway bed. Its rails and ties taken up, perhaps the new freeway had dealt the final blow to the rails. Here the going was somewhat easier. 
mingled with the wind streak to be here at church by all now. Could they be holding services at the village in this weather? Presently came to a burnt out little railway depot. On its platform signboard still the name Anthonyville. Now I walked in a street of sorts, but, a, but no car track to footprints sullying the snow. Anthonyville, Free Methodist Church, walked before him. Indeed, the bell was swinging, now and again faintly ringing in the steeple, but it was the wind's mockery, a knell for the derelict town of Anthonyville. The church door was slamming in the high wind, flying open again, and slamming once more, like a perpetual motion machine, the glass being gone from the church windows. Sarsfield trudged past the skeletal church. The front of Emmons General Store was boarded up, and so was the front of what may have been a drugstore. The village hall was a wreck. The school may have stood upon those scanty foundations which were protruded from the snow. And from no chimney of the, of the decrepit cottages and cabins along Main Street, the only street, did any smoke rise. Sarsfield so never had seen a deader village. An upper window of what looked like a livery stable converted into a garage, the faded cardboard sign to be read. Remember your future. Back to Townsend planned. There was no one at all left here, not even some gaunt old couple managing on Social Security. He might force his way into one of the stores or cottages, although on principle and prudence he generally steered clear of possible charges of breaking and entering. But that would be cold comfort. And for Anthony Bill, there must remain some living soul. His mittened hands clutching his red ears, Sarsfield had plodded nearly to the end of Main Street. Anthony Bill was here, Ensville, he saw now. River and swamp, a new highway cut it off altogether from the rest of the frozen world, except for the drift of obliterated country road that twisted southward, Lord knew whither. He might count himself lucky to find his stove left behind in some shack. He could feed with boards ripped from walls. Main Street ended at that grove of old, or park of old maples. Just a sugar bush, like those he had tapped in his boyhood and his father's rough command. No, had the trees, been, had the trees not been leafless, he might not have discerned the big stone house among the trees, the only substantial building remaining to Anthonyville. The he did for one moment before the blizzard veiled it from him. There were stone gate posts, too, and a bronze tablet set into one of them. Sarsfield brushed the snowflakes in the description. Tamarack House. Stumbling among the babels so toward this promise, he almost collided with a tall glacial boulder. A similar boulder rose a few feet to the right, pair of them halfway between gate post and house. There was a bronze tablet on this boulder, too, and he paused to read it. Sacred to the memory of Jerome Anthony, July 4th, 1836, January 14th, 1915. Brigadier General in the Corps of Engineers, Army of the Republic. Founder of this town, architect of Anthonyville State Prison, who died as he had lived with honor. And there will I keep you forever, Yes, forever in the day, till the walls have crumbled in ruin and molder and dust away. Well, there's an epitaph for a prison architect, Sarsfield thought. It was too bitter an evening for expecting the other boulder, and he hurried toward the, toward the, port, the portico of Tamarack House. This is a very big house indeed, a, bra a, a bracketed house, built all of square field stone with beautiful glints in the masonry, a cupola top of it. Once come out of the cold into a public library, Sarsfield had poured through a picture book about American architectural styles. There was a word for this sort of house. Was it Italianate? Yes, it rose up in his memory. He took pride in no quality except his power of recollection. Yes, that was the word. Had he visited this house before? He could not account for a vague familiarity. Perhaps there had been a photograph of this particular house in that library book. Every window was heavily shuttered and no smoke rose from any of the several chimneys. Sarsfield went up the stone steps to confront the oaken front door. It was a formidable door, but it seemed as if at some time it had been broken open. For long ago, a square of oak with a different grain had been mortised into the area around lock and keyhole. There was a gigantic knocker with a strange face looked upon it. Sarsfield knocked repeatedly. No one answered. Specifically, the storm might have made his pounding inaudible to any occupants. Who could spend the winter in a shuttered house without fires? Another bronze plaque was screwed to the door. Tamarack House. Property of the Anthony, Bill, of the Anthony Family Trust. Guarded uh, by protective service. Sarsfield down to the veracity of the last line. He made his way around to the back. No one answered those back doors either. And uh, they too were locked. 
And presently he found what he had hoped for. An old fangled slanting cellar door was set into the foundations. It was not wise to enter without permission. At least he might accomplish it without breaking. His fingers, though clumsy, were as strong as the rest of them. After much trouble and with help from the Boy Scout knife that he carried, he pulled the pins out of the cellar door's three hinges and scrambled down into the darkness. With the passing of the years, he had become something of a jailhouse lawyer, though those young inmates support him with their endless talk about Miranda and Escobedo. And now he thought of the doctrine called defense of necessity. If caught, he could say that self preservation and freezing is the first necessity. Besides, they might not take him for a bum. Faint light to down the cellar stairs, we would be placed in the hinge fence later, showed up an inner door at the foot. That door was hooked, the hook only. With a sigh, Sarsfield put his shoulder to the door. The hook clattered to the stone floor inside as he was master of all he surveyed. In that black cellar, he found no light switch. Though he never smoked, he carried matches for such emergencies. Having lit one, he discovered a providential kerosene lamp on his table. There's enough kerosene still in it. Sarsfield went lamplit through the cellars and up more stone stairs into a pantry. Anybody home? He called. It was an airy echo. He would make sure before exploring, for he dreaded the shotguns. Uh, how about a cheerful song? In that shell pantry, Sarsfield bellowed a tune formerly beloved at Rotary Clubs. Uh, once a wagon Shibotarian, after half an hour's talk with the whole bow extraordinary, had taken, him to, had taken him to Rotary for lunch and demanded him to tell tales of the road and to sing the members a song. Frank Sarsfield's untutored voice was loud enough when he wanted it to be, and he sang the song he had sung to the Rotary. There's a long, long trail a winding into the land of my dreams, where the nightingales are singing and the white moon beams. There's a long, long night of waiting until my dreams all come true, till the day when I'll be going down that long, long trail with you. No response. No cry, no footstep, not a rustle. Even in so big a house, they couldn't have failed to hear his song, sung in a voice fit to wake the dead. Father O'Malley had called Frank's voice stentorian, a good word, though he was not just sure what it meant. Uh, he liked that last line, though he'd no one to walk to. He repeated, To the day when I'll be going down that long, long trail with you. It was all right. Sarsfield went to the dining room where he found a splendid long walnut table, chairs with embroidered seats, a fine sideboard, and a china cabinet, and a high Venetian chandelier. The china was in that cabinet, and the silverware was in that cupboard. But in no room of Tamarack House was any living soul. Sprawled in the big chair before the fireplace in the Sunday parlor, Sarsfield took the chill out of his bones. The woodshed, connected with the main house by a passage in the kitchen, was half filled with logs. Not first rate fuel, true, for they had been stacked there three or four years ago to judge by the fungi upon them, but burnable after he had collected old newspapers and chopped kindling. He had crisscrossed elm and birch to make a noble fire. It was not very risky to let the white wood smoke eddy from the chimneys, for it would blend with the driving snow when the last would have dissipated at once. Besides, Anthony Bill's population was zero. In the cupola atop the house, in the lull of the blizzard, he looked over the icy countryside and had seen no inhabited farmhouse up the dirt road, which anyway was hopelessly blocked by drifts today. There was no approach for vehicles from the freeway while river and marsh detected the rear. He suspected that Tamarack House might be inhabited summers, although not in any very recent summer. The protective service probably consisted of a farmer who made a fortnightly inspection in fair weather. It was good to hole up in a remote country uh, where burglars seemed unknown as yet. Frank Sarsfield restricted his own depredations to church poor boxes, Catholic preferably, he being no Protestant, and uh, then only under the defense of necessity uh, after a run of unsuccessful mill, uh, 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 mendicancy. Uh, he feared and, detest, uh, and detested strong thieves, so numerous nowadays. To avoid them, and worse than thieves, he steered clear of the cities roving to little places which still kept crime in the family where it belonged. <laughs> uh, he had dined and uh, then washed the dishes dutifully. The kitchen wood range still functioned and so did the hard water and soft water pumps in the, in the scullery. 
As a food, there was enough to feed a good-sized prison. The shelves of the deep uh, cellar cold room threatened to collapse under the weight of glass jars full of jams, jellies, dessert peaches, apricots, applesauce, pickled pork, pickled trout, and many other good things, all redolent of the New England youth. Most of the jars had neat paper labels, all giving the year of canning, some of the name of the canner, and the front shelves. The most recent date that he found was, six, was 1968, a little pot of strawberry jam. And below it was the name Allegra in a feminine hand. Everything in this house lay in apple pie order. Though Sarsfield wondered how long the plaster would keep from cracking, the tamarack house unheated in winter. He felt first positively virtuous for lighting fires, one here in the Sunday parlor, another in the little antique iron stove in the bedroom he had chosen for himself at the top of the house. He had booked into every handsome room of tamarack house with the intense pleasure of a small boy who had found his way into an enchanted castle. Every room was satisfying, well furnished. He was warming with the fire two sheets in the linen closet for his bed. And wondrously old-fashioned. There was no electric light, no central heating, no bathroom. There was an indoor privy at the back of the woodshed, but no running water unless one counted the hand pumps. There was an old-fashioned uh, wall telephone. Frank tried, greatly daring, for the operator, but it was dead. He had found a crystal set radio that didn't work. There was an old lady, this is an old lady's house, surely, and the old lady hadn't visited it for some years. So perhaps her relatives kept it in order as a holiday home or in hope of selling it. I drew an Anthony Bell, a forlorn hope. He discovered two canisters of tea, a jar full of coffee beans, and ten gallons of kerosene. I'll talk to Perhaps the old lady was dead, buried under the other boulder among the maples in front of the house. Perhaps she'd been the general's daughter. But no, or not if the general had been born in 1836. Why those graves in the law? Sarsfield had heard of farm families near medical schools who in the old days had buried their dead at the house for fear of body snatchers. But that couldn't apply to Anthony, though. Well, there were family graveyards. This must be one of the smallest. The old general built this house had died on January 14th. The day after the war, January 14th had come around again, and it would be Frank Sarsfield's 60th birthday. I drink your health and water, General. Sarsfield said aloud, uh, raising his cast cut glass goblet taken in the china cabinet. There was no strong drink in the house, but that didn't stress Sarsfield, for he never touched it. His mother had warned him against it, and sure enough, at one time he had drunk a good deal of wine. When he was due to the road, he'd got sick. Thanks, General, for your hospitality. Nobody responded to his toast. His mother had been a saint, the neighbors had said, and his father a drunken devil. He had seen neither of them after he ran away. He had missed his mother's funeral because he had no one of a death the month after. He had missed his father's long later because he chose to miss it, uh, though that omission cost him sleepless nights now. Frank Sarsfield slept poorly at best. Almost always there were nightmares. Yet perhaps he would sleep well enough tonight in that little garret room at the cupola. He had found that several of the bedrooms in Tamarack House had little metal plates over their doorways. There were the general's room, and father's room, and mama's room. Alice's room, and Allegra's room, and Edith's room. By happy coincidence, the little room at the top of the back stair on the garret floor of the house was labeled Frank's room. But he'd not chosen it for that only. At the top of the house, one was safer from sheriffs or burglars. Uh, and uh, through the skylight, there was only a freeze window, a man could get to the roof of the main block. From that roof, one could descend to the woodshed roof by a fire escape of iron lungs fixed to the stone outer wall. And from the woodshed, it was an easy drop to the ground. After that, the chief difficulty would be to run down Main Street and then get across the freeway without being detected while people searched the house for you. Talk of golden locks and the three bears. Uh, much experience had taught Sarsfield uh, much more thought. Had that other Frank, so commemorated uh, over the bedroom door, been a son <laughs> or a servant? Presumably a son. Though so Sarsfield has found no picture of boys in the old velvet <laughs> covered album uh, in the the Sunday parlor, uh, nor any pictures of manservants. <coughs> there were many pictures of the general, a little rooster-like man with a beard, and a father, portly and pleasant-faced, and a mama, elegant, and the three little girls who must be the uh, Miss the Alice and Allegra and Edith. He had especially liked the photographs of Allegra, since he had tasted her strawberry jam. All the girls were pretty, but Allegra, who must have been about seven in most of the pictures, was really charming, with long ringlets and kind eyes and a delicate mouth that curved upward at its corners. Sars, Sarsfield uh, 
adored little girls and distrusted big girls. His mother had cautioned him against bad women, so he had kept away from such. Now, because he liked peace, he had never married. Not that he could have married anyway, because that would have tied him to one place, and he was too clumsy to earn money at practically anything except dishwashing for summer hotels. Not marrying him that he could have no little daughters like a lake. Sometimes he had puzzled the prison psychiatrist. In prison, it was well to play stupid. He had refrained cunningly from reciting poetry to the psychiatrist. Uh, so after testing Sarasfield, they wrote him down as dull normal. He was assigned to labor as a gardener, which meant going around the prison yard picking up trash by a stick with a nail on the end of it. That was easy work, and he detested hard work. Uh, yet when there was truly heavy work to be done in prison, sometimes he would come forward to shovel tons of coal or carry hods of brick or lift big blocks into place. That, too, was his cunning. He impressed the other jailbirds with his enormous strength so that the gangs left him alone. Yes, you're a loner, Frank Sarsfield, he said to himself aloud. He looked at himself in that splendid Sunday parlor mirror which stretched from floor to ceiling. He saw a man overweight but lean enough of face, standing six feet six, built like a bear, a strong nose, so some teeth missing, a strong chin, and with a wild, light blue eyes. He was an uncommon sort of bump. Deliberately, he looked away from his image out of the corners of his eyes, as it was, was his way, because he was nonviolent and eye contact might mean trouble. You look like a Viking, Frank. Old Father O'Malley had told him once, but you ought to have been a monk. Oh, Father, he answered, I'm too much of a fool for a monk. Well, said Father O'Malley, you're no more fool than uh, many a brother, and you're a celibate and, and continent, I take it. Now, you're a slate for that now. Look out, you don't turn berserker, Frank. Go to confession sometime. If a priest that doesn't know you, if you'll not go to me. If you confess, uh, you'll not be haunted. But he seldom went to Mass and never to confession. All those church boxes pilfered, his mother and his father abandoned, his sister neglected. All the ghastly humbling of himself before policemen, all the horror and shame of the prisons. There could be no grace for him now. There's a long, long trail of winding into the land of my dreams. What dreams? He looked up the word Bersaker in Webster, but he would not never do that sort of thing. A man has to keep a control upon himself. Besides, uh, he was a coward, and he loved peace. Nearly all the other prisoners had been brutes, guilty of sin, guilty of Miranda and Escobedo. Uh, once uh, sentenced for rifling a church safe, he had been put in the same cell with a man who had murdered his wife by taking off her head. The head never had been found. Sarsfield had dreamed of that head in such short intervals of sleep as he had enjoyed while the wife killer was his cellmate. Nearly all night, every night, he had lain on the wake, surreptitiously watching the murderer in the opposite bunk and feeling his own neck now and again. <laughs> he had been surprised and pleased when eventually the wife killer had gone hysterical and obtained assignment to another cell. The murderer told the guards he couldn't just couldn't stand being watched all night with that terrible giant who never talked. <laughs> Only one of the prison in psychiatrists had been pleasant or bright, and uh, that had been the old doctor born in Vienna who went round from penitentiary to penitentiary checking on a psychiatric staff. The old doctor had taken a liking to him and had written a report to accompany, accompany Frank's petition for parole. A few months later, in a parole office, the parole officer had gone out hurriedly for a quarter of an hour and Sarsfield had taken the chance to read his own file that the parole man had left in a folder in a desk. Frank Sarsfield has a memory that almost can be described as photographic. So had read one line in the Vienna doctor's report. When he had read that, Sarsfield had known that the doctor was a clever doctor. He suffers chiefly from an arrest of emotional development. They were regarded as a rather bright small boy in some respects. His three temporarily successful escapes from prison suggest that his intelligence has been much underrated. On at least one of those occasions, he could have eluded the arresting officer had he been willing to resort to violence. Sarsfield repeatedly describes himself as nonviolent and has no record of aggression while confined, nor in connection with any of the offenses for which he has been arrested. On the contrary, he seems timid and withdrawn, and might become a victim of, ass of assault from prison were it not for his size, strength, and power of voice. Sarsfield had been pleased enough with that paragraph, but it was a little puzzled about it followed. In general, Sarsfield was one of those uh, 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 repeaters who ought not to be confined, 
uh, were any alternative methods available for restraining men from petty offenses against property. Not only does he lack belligerence against men, but apparently he is quite clean of any record against w uh, women and children. It seems that he does not indulge in autoeroticism auto either, perhaps because of strict instruction by his R.C. mother during his formative years. Uh, I add, however, however, that conceivably Sarsfield is not fundamentally so gentle as his record indicates. He can be energetic in self-defense and pushed to the wall. In his youth, occasionally he was induced for the promise of $5 or $10 to stand up as an amateur against some traveling professional boxer. He admits that he did not fight hard and cried when he was badly beaten. Nevertheless, I am inclined to suspect the potentiality for violence, long repressed but not totally extinguished by years of humbling himself in his grave. This possibility is not uh, so certain as to warrant additional detention, even though three years of Sarsfield's sentence remain unexpired. Yes, he had memorized nearly the whole of that old doctor's analysis, which had got his parole for him. There had been the concluding paragraphs. Francis Sarsfield is oppressed by a haunting sense of personal guilt. He is religious to the point of superstition, an R.C., and appears to believe himself damned. Although worldly wise in a number of respects, he retains an almost unique innocence of others. His frequent humor and candor account for his success much of the time of begging. He has read much during his wanderings in terms of confinement. He has a strong taste for good poetry of the popular sort and has accumulated a mass of miscellaneous information, much of it irrelevant to the life he leads. Although occasionally moody and even surly, most of the time he subjects himself to authority and will work fairly well if closely supervised. Possesses no skills of any sort unless some knack for wood chopping acquired while he was enrolled in the Civilian Conservation Corps can be considered a marketable skill. He appears to be incorrigibly footloose and therefore confinement is more unpleasant to him than, than to most prisoners. It's truly remarkable that he continues to be rational enough with isolation and heavy guilt complex considered. Sometimes he basically, when he does not desire to answer questions, nevertheless he rarely utters a direct lie. His, his personal modesty may be described as excessive. His habits of tenderness are commendable, if perhaps of origins like many Lady Macbeth. Uh, despite his strength, he is a diabetic and suffers from heart murmurs, sometimes painful. Only in circumstances so favorable as to be virtually un unobtainable could Cyrus Field succeed in abstaining from the behavior pattern that has led to his repeated prosecution and imprisonment. The excessive crowding of, the, of this penitentiary considered, however, I strongly recommend that he be released upon parole. Previous psychiatric reports uh, concerning this inmate have been uh, shallow and erroneous, I regret to note. Perhaps Sarsfield's chief psychological difficulty is that from obscure causes he lacks emotional communication with other adults, although able to maintain cordial and healthy relations with small children. He is very, very nearly a solipsist, uh, which in large part may account for his inability to make firm decisions or pursue any regular occupation. In contradiction of previous re analysis of Sarsfield, he should, he should be, not be described as dull, normal, intellectually. Francis Xavier Sarsfield distinctly is neither dull nor normal. <laughs> Sarsfield had looked up solipsist, but he hadn't found himself much of the wiser. He didn't think himself the only existent thing, not most of the time anyway. Uh, he wasn't sure that the old doctor had been real, but he knew his mother had been real before she went straight to heaven. Yeah, he knew that his nightmares probably weren't real, but sometimes while awake he could see things that other men couldn't. In a house like this, he could glimpse little unaccountable movements out of the corners of his eyes. But it wouldn't do to worry about those. He was afraid of those things which other people couldn't see, yet not so frightened of them as most people were. Some of the other inmates called him Crazy Frank, and it had been hard to keep down his temper. If you could perceive more existent things, though not flesh and blood things, than psychiatrists or convicts could, why, uh, were you then a, a solipsist? Well, there was no point in puzzling over it. Dad had taken him out of school to work in the farm when he hadn't finished the fourth grade. So words like solipsist didn't mean much to him. Poet's words, though, he, he mostly understood. He had picked up a rhyme that made children laugh when he told it to them. Well, you don't know it. You're a poet. Your feet show it. They're Longfellows. <laughs> that wasn't very good poetry, but Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was a good poet. They must have loved Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in this house, and especially the children's heart, because of those three little girls named Alice, Allegra, and Edith, and those lions in the general's boulder. Allegra. That's the prettiest of all names ever, and it means Mary, somebody had told it. 
He looked at the cheap wristwatch he had bought, besides the wash and wear suit, with his last dishwashing money from that Lake Superior summer hotel. Well, midnight. It's up the wooden hill for you, Frank Sarsfield, to your snug little room under the rafters. If anybody comes to Tamarack House tonight, it's out the skylight and through the snow for you, Frank, my boy, and no tiny reindeer. If you want to survive in prison or all of it, you stick to your own business and let other folks stew in their own juice. Before he closed his eyes, he would pray for Mother's soul. Not that she really needed it. And then say the little Scottish prayer he had found in a children's book. Some goodies and ghosties and long legged beasties and things that go bump in the night. Good Lord, deliver us. The next morning, the morning before his birthday, Frank Sarsfield went up the circular stair to the cupola, even before making his breakfast of pickled trout, peaches, and strong coffee. The wind had gone down, and it was snowing only lightly now. The drifts were immense. Nobody would make his way to Anthony Bill and Tamarack House this day. The snow plows were busy elsewhere. At this height, he could see the freeway. Nothing seemed to be seen to be moving along it. The dead village lay to the north of him. The east were river and swamp. The shores lined with those handsome tamaracks, the green gone out of them, which had given them its name, their name to this house. Everything in sight belonged to Frank. He had dreamed during the night, the wind howling and whistling around the top of the house. And he had known he was dreaming, but it had been even stranger than usual, if less horrible. In his dream, he had found himself in the dining room of the tamarack house. He had not been alone. The general and Frank and Mama uh, and the three little girls had been dining happily at the long table, and he had waited on them. In the kitchen, an old woman who was the cook and a girl who cleaned had eaten by themselves. And when he had finished filling the family's plate, he had sat down at the end of the table as if, he had, as if he had been expected to do that. The family talked among themselves, and even to him as he ate, somehow he had not been able to hear what they said to him. Suddenly, though, he had pricked up his ears because the Allegra had spoken to him. Frank, she said on the why do, you, why do they call you pumpkin head? The old general had frowned ahead of the table, and Mama had said, Allegra, don't speak that way to Frank. But he had grinned at his Allegra if a little hurt, and had told her, because some men think I've got a head like a jack-o'-lantern and not even see it inside it. <clears throat> Nonsense, Frank, Mama put in. You have a very handsome head. You've got a pretty head, Frank. The three little girls had told him then, almost in chorus, by kidding me. Allegra had come round the table to make her peace. It's going to be a big surprise for you tomorrow, Frank. She had whispered to him. And then she had kissed him on the cheek. That had waked him. Most of the rest of the howling night, he lay in the week trying to make sense of his dream, but he, he couldn't. The people in it had been more real than the people he met on the long, long trail. Now I strolled through the house again, admiring everything. It was almost as if he had seen the furniture and the pictures and the carpets long, long ago. The house must be over a century old, and many of the good things that must go back to the beginning. He would have two or three more days here until the roads were cleared. There were no, no newspapers to tell him about the great storm, of course, and no radio that worked, but that didn't matter. He found a great big, handsome, complete works of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow uh, in Red Morocco, an illustrated copy of the Rubaiyat. He didn't need to read it because he memorized all the quatrains once. There was a black silk ribbon as, as marker between the pages, and he opened it there. A quatrain 44 turned out. Why, if the soul can fling the dust aside and make it on the air of heaven ride, were it not a shame, were it not a shame for him in this clay carcass crippled to abide? That old Vienna doctor, Frank suspected, had, hadn't believed in immortal souls. Frank Sarsfield knew better. But also Frank Sarsfield suspected that his soul would never ride to naked or clothed on the air of heaven. Souls. That put him in mind of his, of his sister, a living soul he had forsaken. He ought to write her a letter on this eve of his 60th birthday. Frank Treble light, his luggage being mostly a safety razor, a hairbrush, and a comb. He washed his shirts and, and socks and underclothes every night, and often his wash and wear suit, too. But he did carry with him a few sheets of paper and a ballpoint pen. Sitting down at the library table, he had built a fire in the library stove also, there being no lack of logs, he began to write to Mary Sarsfield, alone in the Riding Farmhouse in New Hampshire. The spelling wasn't good, he knew, but today he was careful to do his birthday letter using the big old dictionary with the general's book plate in it. To write that letter took most of the day. Two versions were discarded. The last, Frank had done the best he could. Dearest Mary, my sister, it has been nearly nine years since I 
came to visit you and uh, borrowed the seventy eight dollars from you and went away again and uh, never paid it back. I guess you don't want to see your brother Frank again after what I did that time and other times. But the Ethiopian cannot change his skin or the leopard his spot. And when some man like a Jehovah's Witness or that rancher with all the cash gives me quite a lot of money, I mean to send you what I owe, but the post office isn't handy at the time. And so I spent it on presents for little kids I meet and uh, buying new clothes and such. And so it, I never get around to sending you that $78, Mary. Right now I have $29 and more, but the post office at this place is folded up. By the time I get the next count, the money will be mostly gone, and so it goes. I guess probably you'd need the money, and I'm sorry, Mary, but someday maybe I will win in the lottery, and then I'll give you all the thousands of dollars I win. Well, Mary, it's been 41 years and 183 days since Mother passed away. And here I am, 60 years old tomorrow, and you getting on toward 56. I pray, pray that your cough is better and that your son and my nephew Jack is doing better than he was in Tallahassee, Florida. Sometime, Mary, if you would write to me, care of uh, Father Justin O'Malley in Albatross, Michigan, where he is pastor now, I will stop by his rectory and get your letter and read it with joy. But I know I've been a very bad brother, and I don't blame you, Mary, if you never get around to writing to your brother Frank. Mary, I've been staying out of jails and working a little here and there along the road. Now, Mary, you know what I hate most about those prisons. Why, not being on the road, you will say. No, Mary, the worst thing is the foul language the convicts use in mornings and nights. Uh, taking the name of their Lord in vain is the least they do. There's a foul curse word in there every sentence. I wasn't brought up that way any more than you was, Mary, and I will not revile woman or child. It's like being in H dash 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 to hear it. Uh, I'm not in bad shape, except uh, the diabetes is no better, but I take my pills for it when I can buy them and don't have to take needles for it. My, hurt, my heart hurts me dreadfully bad sometimes when I lift heavy things hours on end, and sometimes it hurts me worse at night when I've been just lying there thinking of the life I've led and how I ought to pay you back the $78 and the... Uh, Pay back other folks has helped me too. I owe Father O'Malley four hundred and ninety-seven dollars. I have eleven cents so all together now, and I keep track of it in my head. And when the lottery ticket wins, he will not be forgotten. <laughs> Some people have been quite good to me, and I can still make them laugh. And I recite to them. And generally, I start my reciting with what no person of quality wrote hundreds of years ago: Seven wealthy towns contend for Homer dead, to which the living Homer baked his bread. They like that. And also, they usually like Thomas Gray's Elegy in the Country Churchyard, Leaving the World of Darkness to Me. And I recite all of that, and sometimes some of the quatrains of Omar. At farms, when they ask me, I chop wood for these folks, and I help with the dishes, but I still make it break a good many, as you learned, Mary, nine years ago. But I didn't mean to do, Mary, because I am just clumsy in all ways. Oh, yes, I am good at reciting Frost Stopping by the Woods and his poem about the hired man. I have been reading the poetical works of Thomas Stearns Elliot, so I can recite his The Hollow Man, or much of it, and also his book of Practical Cats, which is comical. When I come to college town, the professor or his wife gives me a sandwich, maybe two dollars, and maybe a ride to the next town. Where I am now, Mary, I ought to study the poems of John Greenleaf Whittier because the, there's been a real blizzard that may be the big, biggest in the state for many years, and I am snowbound. Uh, years ago, I tried to memorize all that poem, but I only got part way, for it's a whopper of a poem. I don't hear much, Mary, much good music, Mary, because, of course, at the motels, there isn't any phonograph or tape recorder. I'd like to hear some good string mute quartet or maybe old folk songs well sung for music, music half chimes to soothe the savage breath. And there's an old Edison at the house where I'm staying now, and what do you know, they have a record of, of a song you and I used to sing together. There's a long, long trail of winding. It's about the newest record in this house. I'll play it again soon, thinking of you, Mary, my sister. Oh, there's a long, long night of waiting. Mary, right now I'm in a big house where the people have gone away for a while, and I watch the house for them and keep some of the rooms warm. Uh, let me assure you, Mary, I won't take anything from this good old house when I go. These are nice people I know, and I just came out of the storm, and I'm very fond of their three, of their three, 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 three sweet little girls. I remember what you looked like when I ran away first, and you looked like one of them called Alice. The one I like best, though, is a leg because she makes mischief and laughs a lot, but it's innocent. I came here just yesterday, but it seems that I've lived in this house before, but of course I couldn't have, and I feel at home here. Nothing in this house could scare me much. You might not like it, Mary, because of the little noises and glimpses you get, but it is a lovely house. And as you know, I like old places that have been lived in a lot. But the way, Mary, once upon a time, Father O'Malley told me that to the Lord all time is eternally present. 
I think this means everything goes on that happens in the world, and any day goes on all at once. So God sees what went on in this house long ago and what's going on in this house today all at the same time. And just as well we don't see through God's eyes because then we'd know everything that's going on that's going to happen to us. And uh, because I'm such a sinner, I don't want to know. Uh, Father O'Malley says that God may forgive me everything and may have some, something special in store for me, but I don't think so because why should he? Uh, and besides, uh, and I'm Father O'Malley says that, that maybe some people work out the purgatory here on earth and I might be one of these. He says we are spirits in the prison house of the body, which is like we were serving time in the world here below. And maybe God forgave me long ago, and I'm just waiting my time and paying for what I did, and it will be all right in the end. Or maybe I'm being given some second chance to set things right. And as Father O'Malley put it, to do that, I'd have to fortify my will and do some signal act of contrition. Father O'Malley even says I might not have to do the, the act actually if I only just made up my mind to do it, really and truly, because what God counts is the intention. But I think people who are in purgatory must know they're climbing up and have hope. And Mary, I think I'm going down, 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 even though I've stared out of prison for some time now. Father O'Malley tells you that for everybody, the battle is won or lost already in God's sight, and that, that well, Satan thinks he has a good chance to conquer. Actually, Satan has lost forever but doesn't know it. And Mary, I never did anybody any good, but only harm to ones that love me. If just once before I die, I could do one signal act that was truly good, then God might love me and let me have the beatific vision. Yet, Mary, I know I'm weak of will and a coward and lazy, and I miss my chance forever. Well, Mary, my only sister, I've bored you long enough, and I just wanted to say hello and tell you to be of good cheer. I'm sorry I whined and complained uh, like a little boy about my health, because I'm still strong and deserve all the pain I get. Mary, if you can forgive your big brother who never grew up, please play it pray for me sometime, because nobody else ever does except possibly Father O'Malley when he isn't busy with other prayers. Uh, I pray for Mother every night, and the every other night for you and uh, once a month for Dad. Um, and you were a good girl and uh, sweet. And now I will say goodbye and ask your pardon for bothering you with my foolishness. Also, I'm sorry your friends found out I was just a hobo when I was with you nine years ago, and I don't blame you for, for being angry with me for talking too much, and I know uh, I wasn't fit to lodge in your house. Now, there aren't many of us old real hobos left, only beatniks and such that can't walk or chop wood, and I guess that is just as well. Uh, it is a degrading life, Mary, but I can't stop walking down that long, long trail not knowing where it is. Your loving brother, Francis Frank. P.S. I don't wish to mislead, so I will add, Mary, that the people who own this house didn't exactly ask me in, but it's all right because I won't do any harm here but a little good as I can. Good night again, Mary. Now I need to do an envelope. But he had forgotten to take one from the last motel where the Presbyterian minister had put him up. It must be one... There's some Tamarack house, and one would not be missed. And that would not be very wrong, because he would take nothing else. He found no envelopes in the drawer of the library table. They went up the stairs and almost knocked at the door of Allegra's room. Foolish. He opened the door gently. He had admitted, he had admitted Allegra's, uh, and he had admired Allegra's small rosewood desk. In this drawer, there was a leather, a leather, a leather, leather folder, the kind with a blotter, he found. And in the folder were several yellow envelopes. Also lying face up in the folder was a letter of several small pages in a woman's hand, a trifle shaky. He started to sit down to read the Allegra's letter that never was sent to anybody. But it passed through his mind that his great body might break the delicate uh, rosewood chair that had belonged to Allegra. So he read the letter standing. It was dated January 14th, 1969. On that birthday of his, he had been in the Joliet prison. How beautifully Allegra wrote. Darling Celia, this is a lonely day at Tamarack House, just 54 years after your great-grandfather, the general, died. And I am writing to my grandniece to tell you how much uh, I, I hope you will be able to come up to Anthonyville and stay with me next summer, if I am still here. The doctor says that uh, only God knows whether I will be. Your grandmother wants me to come down your way to stay with her for the rest of this winter. But I can't bear to leave Tamarack House at my age. But they might have to put me in the rest home down there, and then I wouldn't see this old house again. I am all right, really, because kind Mr. Connor looks in every day, and Mrs. Williams comes every other day to clean. I am not sick, my little girl, but simply older than my years and running down. When you come up next summer, God willing, I will, will make you that soft toast you like, and perhaps Mr. Connor will turn the crank for the ice cream, and I may try to make some preserves for you with you to help me. You weren't lonely, were you, when you stayed with me last summer for a whole month? 
Of course, there are fewer than 100 people left in Anthonyville now, and most of them are old. It says there will be practically nobody here in the town a few years from now, and the new highway is completed and the old one is abandoned. There were more than 2,000 people here in town and around about a few years after the general built Tamarack House. But first the lumber industry ran out and then the mines were exhausted in the prison break in 1915 scared many away forever. There are no passenger trains now and they said the railway line will be pulled out altogether when the new freeway, they just begun building to the east, is ready for traffic. But we are still, uh, we still have the maples and the tamaracks and there are ever so many raccoons and opossums and squirrels for you to watch and the lynx, I think, and uh, an otter or two, and the many deer. Celia, last summer you asked me about the general's death and all those things that happened then because you had heard something of them from your uh, uh, grandmother, Edith. So I didn't wish to frighten you, so I didn't. I didn't tell you everything. Now, you are older now, and you have a right to know, because when you grow up, you will be one of the trustees of the Anthony Family Trust. And then this old house will be in your charge when I am gone. Tamarack House is not at all frightening, except a little on the morning of every January 14th. I do hope that you and uh, the other trustees will keep the house always with the money that Father left to me. He was good at making money, even though the forest vanished and the mine failed by his investments in Chicago, and which I am leaving to the family trust. I kept the house just as it was for the sake of the general's memory and because I love it that way. You asked me what happened on January 14th, 1915. There were seven people on the subs in the house that month, not counting Cook and, and Cynthia, who was a kind of nanny to the dress girls and also clean, because they slept at their houses in the village. In the house, of course, was the great general, your grandfather, uh, my grandfather, your great grandfather, who was uh, nearly 80 years old. Then there were father and mama, and the three of us little sisters, uh, and the dear and dear friend. Alice, and sometimes even that baby Edith, used to tease me in those days by screaming, Frank's Allegra, sweetheart, Frank's Allegra, sweetheart. I used to chase them, but I, I suppose it was true. He liked me best. Of course, he was about 60 years old, though not so, uh, so old as I am now. And uh, I was a little thing. He used to take me through the swamps and show me the, rust, the muskrat's houses. The first time he took me on such a trip, Mama raised her eyebrows when he was out of the room. But the general said, I'll warrant Frank. I have his papers. Alice and Edith might just as well have shouted, Frank's Allegra slaves. He read me uh, old Robert Louis Stevenson's poems and all sorts of books. I never had another sweetheart, partly because almost all the young men left Anthony Hill as I grew up when there was no work for them here, and the ones who remained uh, didn't please Mama. We three sisters used to play creep mouse with Craig. I remember well. We would be the creep mice and would sneak up and scare him when he wasn't watching. He would pretend to be terrified. He made up a little song for us, or rather he put words to some tune he had borrowed. Down, down, down in Creep Mouse Town, all the lamps are low, and the little rodent feet softly come and go. There's a rat in Creep Mouse Town, and a bat or two. Everything in Creep Mouse Town would surely frighten you. You remember, Celia, that the general was the state supervisor of prisons and reformatories for time out of mind? He was a good architect, too, and designed after the old state prison without taking any fee for himself. It was a model prison. Some people in the capital said that he did it to give employment to his county, but really it was because the site was so isolated it would be difficult for convicts to escape. The general knew Frank's last name, but he never told the rest of us. Frank had been born in Anthonyville, uh, had been in Anthonyville State Prison at one time, and later in other prisons, and the general had taken him out of one of those other prisons on parole, having known Frank when he was locked up at Anthonyville. I never learned what Frank had done to be sentenced to prison, but he was gentle with me and everybody else until that early morning of January 14th. The general was amused by Frank and uh, said that Frank would be better off with us than anywhere else. So Frank became a hired man and chopped the firewood for us and kept the fires going in the stoves and fireplaces and sometimes served at dinner. In summer, he was supposed to side the lawn, but of course, summer didn't come. Frank arrived by train at Anthonyville Station in October, and we gave him a little room at the top of the house. Well, on January 12th, Father went up to Chicago on business. We still had the general. Every night he barred the shutters on the ground floor, going round to all the rooms by himself. Mama knew he did it because uh, there was a rumor some life convicts of the prison had it in for the supervisor of prisons, although the general had retired five years earlier. 
Also, they may have thought he kept a lot of money in the house. And actually, what with the timber gone and the mines going, in those times that we were rather hard pressed and certainly kept our money in the bank at Duluth. Well, we girls didn't know why the general closed the shutters, <coughs> except that it was one of the general's rituals. Besides, Anthonyville State Prison was supposed to be escape proof. It was just the general always took precautions, although ever so brave. Just before dawn, Celia, on the cold morning of January 14, 1915, we were awakened by the siren of the prison. And we all rushed downstairs in our night clothes, and we could see that part of the prison was a fire. Oh, the sky was red. The general tried to telephone the prison, but he couldn't get through, and later it turned out that the lines had been cut. Next, it all happened so swiftly. We heard shouting somewhere on Main Street, and then guns went off. The general knew what that meant. He had got on his trousers and his boots on, and now he struggled with his old military overcoat, and he took his arm, old armory revolver. Lock the door behind me, girl, he told Mama. She cried and tried to pull him back inside, but he went down into the snow, nearly 80 though he was. Only a few or four minutes later, we heard the shots. The general had met the convict at the gate. It was still dark, and the, con the general had cataracts in his eyes. They say he fired first and missed. Those bad men had broken into Mr. Emmons' store and taken guns and axes and whiskey. They shot the general, they shot him again and again and again. The next thing we knew, they were chuffing at our front door with axes. Mama hugged us. Celia, dear, writing all this is maybe so silly. I feel a little odd, so I must lie down for an hour or two before telling you the rest. Celia, I do hope you will love this old house as much as I have. If I'm not here when you come up, remember that uh, where I've gone, I will know the general and father and mama and Alice and poor dear Frank and uh, we'll be ever, ever so happy with them. Be a good little girl, my Celia. The letter ended there, unsigned. Frank plumped down downstairs in, his, in, the, in the, the Sunday parlor. He was crying for the first time since he had fought that uh, professional heavyweight on October 19, 1943. The leg was done. He did practice for the approaching days on the long, long trail. I hear in the chamber above me the patter of little feet, the sound of a door that is opened, and voices soft and sweet. Here he ceased. Had he heard something in the passage, or descending the broad hall stair? Because of the wind outside, he could not be certain. It cost him a gritting of his teeth to rise and open the parlor door. Of course, no one could be seen in the hall or on the stair. Crazy Frank, men had called him at Joliet and other prisons. He had punched his fist, but he kept a check upon himself. Didn't St. Paul say the violent take heaven by storm? Perhaps he had barked up the wrong tree. Or perhaps he'd be stood out of his mouth for being too peaceful. Shutting the door, he, went, he walked, went back to the fireside. Those lines of Longfellow had been no, no application. He put the long, long trail on the old phonograph again, strolling about the room until the record ran out. There was an old print of a great lake scooter on the one wall that he liked. Besides, he decided he noticed there seemed to be some pellets in, in, embedded in the closet door frame. They painted over as if someone had fired a shotgun in the parlor in the old days. Violent, take it by storm. He admired the uh, grand piano. Perhaps Allegra had learned to play it. There were only one or two notches, big notches or gashes along one edge of the, of the piano, varnished over, hard as that wood was. Then Frank sank into the big chair again and stared at the burning logs. Just how long he had, doubt, had dozed, he did, did not know. He woke abruptly. Had he heard a whisper? The faintest whisper? He tends to spring up. Before he could move, he saw reflections in the tall mirror. Something had moved in the corner of the bookcase. No doubt about it. That small something had stirred again. Also, something crept behind one of those fat sofas, and something else looked near the piano. All these were at his back. He saw the reflections in the glass, in the glass darkly, more alarming than physical form. In this high, shadowy room, the light of the kerosene lamp and of the seven candles did not suffice. From near the bookcase, the first of them emerged as a candlelight, then the second, and the third. They were giggling. He could not hear them, only see their faces, and those not clearly. He was unable to stir, and the goose flesh prickled all over him, and his hair rose to the back of his big head. 
There were three little girls, barefoot, in their long muslin nightgowns, ready for bed. One maybe had been as much as 12 years old, the smallest was a little more than a baby. The middle one was Allegra, a tiny even for her tender years, and a little imp. He knew, he knew, they were playing creep pals. The three of them stole forward, Allegra in the lead, her eyes of light. You could see them playing now, and the dread was ebbing out of him. He might have risen and turned to greet them across the great gulf of time, but any action, why, what might it do to these little ones? Frank sat frozen in his chair, looking at the nimble reflections in the mirror. The nearer they came, perfectly silent. Allegra vanished in them from the glass, which meant that she must be standing just behind him. He must please them. Could he speak? He tried, and the lines came out hoarsely. Down, down, down in Creek House Town. All the lamps are low, and the little rodent feet. He was not permitted to finish. Wow. There came a light tug. At the, curly, at the curly white hair at the back of his head. Oh, to talk of the leg with him. Breakfast, he heaved his bunk out, his bulk out of, out, of the, out, of the, out of the chair and swung round. Too late. The parlor door was closing. From that hall came another whisper, ever so faint, ever so unmistakable. Good night, Frank. There followed subdued giggles, scampering, and then the silence once more. He strode to the parlor door. The hall was empty again and the broad stair. Should he follow them up? No, all three would be in bed now. Should he knock at Mama's room, muttering, Mrs. Anthony, uh, are the children all right? No, he hadn't the nerve for that. It would be presumptuous. He had been given one moment of perception and no more. Somehow I knew they, they would not go as far as the garret floor. Ah, he needed fresh air. He snuffed out lamp and candles except for one candlestick, Allegra's, that he took with him. Out into the hall he went. He unfastened the front uh, door uh, with that oaken patch about the middle of it and stepped upon the porch, leaving the burning candle adjusted in the hall. The wind had risen again, bringing still more snow. It was black as sin outside, and the temperature must be 30 below. For him, the wind bore one erratic peal of the desolate church bell of Anthonyville, and then another. How strong the blast must be to that gulfry. Frank retreated inside from that unfathomable darkness and that sepulchral bell which seemed to toll for him. He locked the thick door behind him and screwed up his courage for the expedition to his room at the top of the old house. But why shudder? He loved them now, Allegra most of all. Up the broad stairs to the second floor he went, hearing only his, his own clumsy footfalls, and past the clear play-sealed doors of the general and Mama and their father and Alice and Allegra and Edith. No one whispered. No one scampered. In Frank's room, he rolled himself in his blankets and quilt, and Allegra helped stick the patchwork. And almost at once, the consciousness went out of him. He must have slept dreamless for the first night since he had been a farm boy. So profound had been his sleep, deep almost his death that the siren may have been wailing for some minutes before at last it roused him. Frank knew that horrid sound. It had called him for, for twice before as he fled from prisons. Who wanted him now? He heaved his ponderous body out of the warm bed. The candle he had brought up from the Sunday parlor and left burning all night was flickering in its socket. But by that flame he could see the hour in his watch. Seven the clock, too soon for dawn. Through the narrow skylight as he flung on his clothes, the sky glowed in a natural red, as, uh, though it was long before sunup. The prison siren ceased to wail as it choked off. Frank lumbered to the little freeze window at the south of the north, perhaps two miles distant, a monstrous mass of flame shooting high into the air. The prison was afire. Then came shots outside. First the bark of a heavy, heavy revolver, followed irregularly by blasts of shotguns or rifles. Frank was placing his boots with a swiftness uncongenial to him. He got into his overcoat as it came a crashing and battering downstairs. That sound, too, he recognized, wood chopper that he had been, axes battering at the front door. Amid this pandemonium, Frank was far too bewildered to grasp altogether where he was or even how the catastrophe might be fitted into the pattern of time. All that mattered was flight. The scheme of his escape remained in clear in his mind. Pull up the chair below the skylight, keep yourself out the upper roof, descend those iron rungs to the woodshed roof, Make for the other side of the highway, then 
Why, then you must trust you, circumstance, Frank. It's a long, long trail of landing for you. Now he heard a woman screaming within the house and slipped and fumbled his alarm. He got up on the chair, opened the skylight, was trying to obtain a good grip on the icy outer edge of the skylight frame. And somebody knocked and kicked at the door of Frank's room. If those were puny knocks and kicks, he was about to heave himself upward when, in a relative quiet, the screaming had ceased for a moment. He heard a little, shrill little voice outside his room urgently pleading, Frank, Frank, let me in. He was arrested in flight as though great weights had been clamped to his ankles. That little voice he knew as if it were a part of him, a legless voice. For a brief moment, he still meant to scramble out of the skylight. But the sweet little voice was begging. He stumbled off the chair, upset it, and was at the door one stride. Is that you, Allegra? Open it, Frank. Frank, please open it. He turned the key and pulled the bolt. In the threshold, the little girl stood in the sink of the dying candlelight, terribly pale, all tears, frantic. Frank snatched her up. Now, this was dear, real Allegra Anthony, all warm and soft and sobbing, flesh and blood. He kissed her hand, he kissed her cheek gently. She clung to him in terror, and the man squirmed loose, tugging at his heavy hand. Oh, Frank, come on, come, come downstairs, they're hurting Mama. Who is the little girl? He held her tiny hand, his body quivering with dread and uh, indecision. Who's down there, Allegra? It's the path, then. Come on, Frank. Braver than he, the little thing plunged down the garret stairs to the darkness below. Allegra! Come back here! Come back now! He bellowed, he bellowed as if she was gone. Up two flights of stairs, there poured to him a tumult of shrieks, curses, laughter, breaking noises. Several men were below, their speech slurred in rockets. He did not need Allegra to tell him what kind of men they were, for he heard prison slang and prison foulness, and he shook all over. There still was a skylight. He would have turned back to that hole in the roof had not Allegra squealed in pain somewhere on the second floor. Dazed, uh, trembling, unarmed, Frank went three steps down the garret staircase. Allegra! Little girl, what is it, Allegra? Someone was charging up the stair toward him. It was a burly man in the prison uniform, a lighted lantern in one hand and a glittering axe in the other. Frank had no time to turn. The man screeched up silly at him and swung the axe. Those post quarters, wielded by a drunken man, it was a chancy weapon. The, flat, the edge shattered the plaster wall, the flat of the blade thumped upon Frank's shoulder. Frank, uh, lurching forward, took the man by the throat with a money grip. They all tumbled pell-mell down those steep stairs, the two men, the axe, the lantern. Frank's ursine bulk landed atop the stranger's body. Frank heard his adversary's bones crunch. The lantern had broken and gone out. The convict's head hung, hung loose in his shoulders. Frank found as he groped for the axe. Then he trembled with the fallen man and flung himself along the corridor, gripping the axe held. Allegra! Allegra, girl! From the head of the main stair, he could see that the lamps and candles were burning in the hall, and in the room was the ground floor. All three children were down there, wailing, and above their noise rose an ominous shrieks again. A mob of men were stamping, breaking things, roaring with amusement and desire, shouting filth. The bottles shattered. His heart pounding as if it would burst out of his chest, Frank hurried rashly along the, uh, the stair and uh, down the stair and went all crimson with fury into the Sunday parlor, the double bitted axe swinging in his hand. They were all there, the little girls, Mama, and five wild men. Stop that! Frank roared in all the power of his lungs. You let them go! Everyone in the parlor stood transfixed to that summons like the last trump. Allegra had been tugging pathetically at the leg of a dark man who gripped her mother's waist. And the other girls sputtered and sobbed, cornered as a tall man poured a bottle of whiskey over them. Mrs. Anthony's gown was ripped nearly its whole length, and the third man was bending her backward by her long hair as if he would snap her spine. Near the hall door stood a man like a long, lean rat, the rat of Creep Mouse Town, a shotgun on his arm, deep jawed at Frank's intervention. Guns and axes lay scattered about the turkey carpet. Fireplace, the fifth man had been eating the poker in the flames. For that tableau moment, they all stared astonished, the raving giant who had burst upon them. And the giant, puffing, stared back with his strange blue eyes. Oh, Frank! Allegra sobbed, his war command and entreaty. As if Frank thought in a flash of insane mirth, he were like the boy in the fairy tale who could cry confidently, All oh, heads off, the bride! He knew what these men were. 
rats and bats in Creek Mouse Town. The worst men in any prison, lifers who made their hell upon earth. Killers, all of them, and worse than killers. The rotten damnation showed in all those flushed and drunken faces. And the dark man let go of Mama in sudden relief with a coughing laugh. <laughs> hell, it's only old fucking head Frank. Found him again. Have some fun for yourself, Frank boy. Hey, Frank. That face asked him, the shotgun hooked under his arm. Where'd the old man keep his money? Frank towered there perplexed. The berserker lust draining out of him, almost bashful. And frightened worse than ever before in all its years in the trail. What should he shout now? What should he do? Who was he to resist such perfect evil? They were five to one. And those five were fiends from down under. And that one, a coward. Long ago, he had been weighed in the balance and found money. Mama was the first to break the tableau. The second captor had relaxed his clutch upon her hair. She parted the little girls before her and leaped for the door. The hair puller was after her at once, but she bounded past rat, rat faces shotgun, which had wavered toward Frank, and Alice and Edith were ahead of her. Allegra, her eyes wide and desperate, tripped over the rung of a broken chair. Everything happened in half a second. The hair puller caught Allegra by her little ankle. Then Frank uh, fell it again, loudest in all his life, and then swung his axe high above his head and downward, a skillful, baneful stroke, catching the hair puller's arm just below the shoulder. And once the man began to scream and spout, while Aunt Allegra fled after her mother. Falling, the hair puller collided with rat face, pointing his aim. One barrel of the shotgun fired, and Frank felt pain in his side. His bloody axe on high, he hulked between the five men and the door. All the men's faces were glaring at Frank incredulously as if demanding how he dared stir against them. Three convicts were scrabbling tipsily for weapons on the floor. As Frank strode and stood among them, he saw the expression on those faces change from gloating to desperation. Just as the second blow descended, there passed through his mind a kind of fleshly collage of death he had seen once at a farmyard gate. Corpses of five weasels nailed to a gatepost to the farmer, the frozen open jaws the gate like damned souls in hell. All heads off of mine! Frank heard himself bring. All heads off of mine! He hacked and hewed his own screams of lunatic fury, drowning out their screams of terror. For less than three minutes, shots, thuds, shrieks, crashes, Horrible wailing. They could not get past him to the doorway. Come on! Frank was raging in the middle of the parlor. Come on! Who's next? All heads off but mine! Who's next? There came no answer but a ghastly rattle from one of the five heaps that littered the carpet. Blood soaked from hair to boots, the berserker towered alone, swaying where he stood. His mind began to clear. He had been shot twice, Frank guessed, and the pain in his heart was frightful. And it was frantic consciousness first all the glory of what he had done and all the horror. He became almost rational. He must count the dead. One upstairs, five here. One, two, three, four, five heaps. That was it. Correct. All present and accounted for, Frank boy. Funkin' head Frank. Crazy Frank. All dead and accounted for. Had he thought that thought before? Had he taken that mock roll before? Had he walked the slaughter over twice, twice in the same old room? But where were Mama and the little girl? They mustn't see this blood splash in front of a parlor. He was looking at himself in the tall mirror, and he saw a bear-like man loathsome with his own blood and others' drug. He looked like the wild man of Borneo. In abhorrence, he flung his axe aside. Behind him sprawled the reflections of the hack dead. Running down his heart pain, he reeled into the hall. Little girls! Mrs. Anthony! Allegra! Oh, Allegra! His voice was less strong now. Where, where are you? It's safe now. He did not call back. He labored up the main stair, clutching his side. Allegra, speak to your Frank. They were in none of the bedrooms. He went up the garret stair, whatever the agony. Then beyond Frank's room, the cupola stair. I said that that slowly, gasping hard. They were not in the cupola. Might they have run off among the trees? In that cold dawn, he stared on every side. He thought his sight was beginning to fail. He could see no one outside the house. 
The drift still tilted the streets beyond the gatepost, and those two boulders protruded impassive from the untrodden snow. Back down the flights of stairs, he made his way, clutching at the rail at the wall. Surely the little girls hadn't strayed into that part of butcher shop. He bit his lip and peered into the Sunday parlor. The bodies were all gone. The splashes and ropey strands of blood were all gone. Everything stood in perfect order, as if the violence had never touched Tamarack House. The sun was rising, and the sunlight filled into the shutters. Within 15 minutes, the trophies of the savage victory had disappeared. It was like the recurrent dream which had tormented Frank when he was little. He separated from mother in the dark, a wandering solitary in empty lanes, with no soul alive in all the universe of little Frank. If those tremendous axe blows had severed living flesh and blood, for one moment, there on the stairs, he had held in his arms a tiny quick leg, but that reality he did not doubt at all. Wonder subduing pain, he staggered to the front door. It stood unshattered. He drew the bar and turned the tree, and went down in the stone steps into the snow. He was weak now and did not know where he was going. Had he done a signal act? Let the Lord give him one parting glimpse of little Allegra somewhere among those trees. He slipped in a drift, half rose, sank again, crawled. He found himself at the foot of one of the bull's boulders, the further one, but a stone he had not expected. The snow had fallen away from the face of the bronze tablet. Touching the boulder, Frank drew himself up. By bringing his eyes very close to the tablet, he could read the words, a dying man panting against death with bronze, a loving memory of Frank, a spirit in prison made for eternity who saved us and died for us January 14, 1915. Why, if the soul can fling the dust aside and make it on the air of heaven ride, Wert not a shame, wert not a shame for him, in this clay carcass coupled to abide.